Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So let's start with the revision of chapter number two, residential status. A very easy chapter. So before I start with this chapter, please, uh, you should have a clear picture in your mind that what are the topics which we should cover in this chapter. So first of all, you should know why this chapter is important for us. Why we have to determine the residential status of any assessee. You should know this first. Why? How we will determine that is second thing. But you should know why this is important. I'll be discussing that point here in this lecture. Second is, second point comes that how we will be determining the residential status. This is something which is important for examination because in examination we can uh, we see that there are questions uh, where examiner will ask you that they will give you some certain information about SSE. They will give you uh, some point that his day of, days of stay in India is so and so and please determine the residential status. So how we are going to tackle with those questions, especially in C intermediate examination, individual uh, is something which is important. Although we will uh, cover HUF firm, AOP, BY company also, which is relatively very easy. But for individual, it is most important that you should know how to determine the residential status of individual. Because you understand, an individual can be a resident or that person can be a non-resident. So how we will be determining whether he, uh, his, he is a resident, he or she is a resident or that person is a non-resident, we have to apply basic conditions we have to apply basic conditions so you should be well versed with those basic conditions what are those two basic conditions and if any one of the basic conditions get satisfied then we will say that yes the assessee is a resident and if both the conditions are not getting not satisfied then we will say this assessee is a non-resident if that person is a non-resident okay you will stop it over there but if any of the conditions get satisfied we will say assess is a resident. Then we have to determine further whether the person is a ordinary resident or a not ordinary resident. Yes, you remember that ordinary resident or not ordinary resident. How we will be de determining this by applying additional conditions. So we should be very much aware about those. What are those two additional conditions which we have to see? Right. Also, there are certain exceptions also because in basic condition, we understand one basic condition is 182 days during the previous year. Second condition is 60 days or more and uh, in the previous year and 365 days or more in the last four preceding years. But for some people, we don't see that 60, 60 days condition. We ignore, we completely ignore that 60 days condition. We will only apply 182 days conditions. So we should know what are the cases, what are the exceptions of that particular rule where we have to ignore those 60 days. So we should know about those exceptions also. Okay. Again, we have seen in examination, there are certain questions related to continuous discharge certificate. Have you heard this point? Uh, this word continuous discharge certificate is it is especially for crew members. So whenever they start their journey, so in their continuous discharge certificate, the captain of the ship writes, what is the, your start date of the journey? and what is the end date of the journey. So if this type of question will come in your examination, you should know how to deal with those questions. I'll be discussing that. Next is there are special provisions also for Indian citizen or person of Indian origin whose income exceeds 15 lakh rupees, which income other than foreign sources income. So we should know that provisions also that what are the special provisions which we have to apply in those cases, right? Okay, so how we will be determining the residential status of individual and all these points we should have we have to cover and also different assessees residential status. This question is one of the favorite question of examiner. You can see that in past there are so many times that examiner has asked this question scope of total income where they will give you some five or six types of income and they will ask. If the assessee is an ordinary resident, how much income will be taxable? If the assessee is a not ordinary resident, how much income will be taxable? If that person is a non-resident, then how much income will be taxable? So we have to see that whether that income is taxable in the hands of a resident or not or non-resident or not. And we have to um, solve that question accordingly. So uh, we will be discussing that portion also. And the last portion which we have in this chapter is because we understand any income which arises in India, any income which arises in India is taxable in the hands of every type of person. 
whether that person is a resident or that person is a non resident and we also know that any income which is deemed to arise in india any income which is deemed to arise in india that is also taxable but what does this phrase means deemed to arise what does this mean deemed to arise so we should know that what are the cases where income is said to be deemed to arise in india we will be discussing that also and similarly we understand income which is received in india is taxable in every hands and also which is income which is deemed to be received in india so what are the cases where we can say that this income is deemed to be received in india right so once we are through with all these topics we can say that we have a very good command we have a strong com command over this chapter okay so let's uh, start with this uh, residential status chapter first of all let me tell you why it is important why we are doing this chapter why this chapter is there in income tax act why residential status okay we know that uh, especially for the individual we can uh, divide individual in three parts either that individual can be a ordinary resident right or that individual can be a not ordinary resident or that person can be a non resident even right so this is resident one is ordinary second is not ordinary and the third one is non resident we understand that any income which arises in india any income which arises in india or in fact deemed to arise also deemed to arise also we know that here is no problem with the residential status because this type of income indian government will say boss this is the income which you are earning because of india because this income is getting arise in india or deemed to arise in india so in this case for this type of income everybody has to pay taxes whether that person is a resident or that person is a non resident everyone has to pay taxes there is no problem here so for the such type of income there is no issue whether that person we don't have to determine the residential status we can say because this is taxable in everybody's act okay second thing if income is received in india this income is received in india or it also includes deemed to receive in india deemed to receive in india we understand that everyone has to pay tax on such type of income so whether that person is a resident ordinary not ordinary or that person is a non resident then also it is taxable in everybody's hand so if a person has income which is arising in india or received in india so everybody has to pay taxes so it is hardly making any difference that the person is resident or that person is a non resident but now the question comes if there is any income which is not arising in india neither arising in india nor received in india so if there is any income which does not arise in india does not arise or does not get received in india that we understand non resident will say no no i will not going to pay tax on this because why because this income has no connection with india it is not getting arise in india not neither getting received in india why should i pay taxes the answer is correct so such type of income is not taxable in the hands of non resident correct but if i ask you about ordinary resident we will we know that for ordinary resident global income is taxable global income is taxable so even if this income is not getting arise in india not getting received in india this person has to pay tax on such income also so here there is a difference on this type of income non resident does not have to pay tax resident has to pay tax so we should know if we have a client if he has such income which is net not getting arise in india not neither getting received in india so we have to determine the residential status first so we could understand that whether it should be taxable in their hand or it should not be taxable if that person is a non resident we will not make it taxable in his hands right and you understand also 
what we uh, do for not ordinary not ordinary generally he will, we will say no he will not going to pay tax on this income but sometimes the answer is yes also sometimes the answer is yes also when it was it was when this income is not getting arise in india neither getting received in india but it is controlled from india if it is getting controlled from india which is a business which is controlled from india the profession which was set up in india then this person has to pay tax on that income also so i was asking why residential status why residential status is important for us because for for such type of income we should know about the residential status because we have a different treatment for non resident we have a different treatment for resident so for such type of income it is important and second thing is that there are certain provisions in income tax act which are different for resident and they are different for non resident also so that for that purpose also it becomes important for us to know whether what is the residential status of a particular ssc so do you understand now why residential status is important for us one thing is pro, uh, regarding this income we should know because we have a different treatment for residential and non resident ssc and also there are different provisions in income tax act certain provisions in income tax act which says that they will be uh, applicable only for uh, for resident or they will be applicable only for non resident so for uh, applying those provisions as well we should know what is the residential status right now we are through with this second thing is how we will be determining the residential status very important and first is about individual how we will be determining the residential status of individual first of all we understand that this individual can be resident also or that person can be a non resident also right so to determine whether that person is a resident or that person is a non resident we should know the basic condition we should know the basic condition so what are those two basic conditions first condition says that if that individual is in india for 182 days for 182 days or more when during the previous year during the previous year if that person is in india for 182 days or more during the previous year then we will say the person is a resident that person is a resident but what if if he is less than 182 days let's say 181 days or so first condition was not satisfied because it requires 182 days first of all tell me in previous year or assessment year it is in previous year right his stay in india should be in the previous year 182 days or more but if he does not satisfy the first condition we have second condition also because either of the one condition should satisfy second condition says that if he is in india for 60 days or more during the previous year plus second condition has two sub conditions right 60 days or more during the previous year and 365 days or more in the preceding 4 years what is this preceding 4 years see our previous year is 23 24 for our 2024 examinations we have previous year 23 24 so before these 4 years so 4 years we have to take preceding those previous year if that person is in india for 365 days or more 60 days during the previous year and 365 days or more in the preceding 4 years we will say this this is the second condition if any one of this then get satisfied the assess is a resident but what if he was not even 60 days in the previous year we will say sir none of the basic condition is satisfied so the assess is a non resident right so if you can see this in your book also i think you have already downloaded this book it is available in pdf format you can easily download it from the website rajatmoga.com in the download section if you will go then you will um, get the link of this book okay so this is page number 2.3 see the basic condition what it is written over there number of days of stay in india is 182 days or more during the previous year or 60 days or more during the previous year and 365 days or more in the last four preceding years so if anyone either first if first get satisfied you no need to go for the second condition because anyone should be satisfied if first get satisfied you will say straight away that person is a resident if this does not get satisfied please go and check this one 
if this gets satisfied, we can say that person is a resident, right? Tell me, he should be in India. What does India mean? India includes territorial waters of India. So let's say if the person is uh, not on the main land, but he was in territorial waters of India, that is up to 12 nautical miles, we will say that person is still in India. Second thing is that whether that period should be continuous, whenever he comes to India, so he should be there for 182 days continuously or he can uh, come and he can go leave India. That would be sufficient for us. That is sufficient for us. We have to count the total number of days during the previous year. So our previous year is, year is I'm again repeating, this is 23, 24, started from 1st of April 23 till 31st of March 2024. So if that person is in India, whether he is uh, coming to India, then he is there in India for 30 days, then he went back to his country, then again he come, uh, comes. So in that case, we have to count his total number of days, right? And the day when he is arriving in India, that should also be included in the stay in India. And the day which where he is going, he is departing from India, that day should also be included. Both the days are inclusive. That I have written it over here, date of arrival as well as the date of departure, both is included. It will be considered that on that day also he was in India, right? Okay. Second thing is that if we know that person is a resident, if any of the basic conditions are satisfied, we have to further determine whether the person is a ordinary or not ordinary. For that, we have to apply additional conditions. So what are those additional conditions? If you go, uh, come to the next page, so there are two additional conditions and if both of them should be satisfied, both of them simultaneously, they have to be satisfied. Both of them should be satisfied. If they get satisfied, we will say that person is a ordinary resident. And if any of the condition is not satisfied or both the condition does not get satisfied, we will say that person is a not ordinary resident. So first, please check. This is easy. So I think you must have, uh, some of you uh, must have um, uh, done this second condition first and this you have done as second. So this is okay. This is perfectly fine. You can uh, check either of the condition. But 730 days is relatively easy. So in your examination, I will suggest you please, first, please check 730 days condition, right? So if total stay in India is 730 days or more in the last seven preceding year, what is this last seven preceding year? Preceding to the previous year. So our previous year is 23, 24. So we have to see these seven years before that previous year, that preceding seven years, we have to see whether his stay in India is 730 or more. If it is less than 730, then this condition is not satisfied. We can simply say that this person is a not ordinary. We don't have to check the second condition because both the condition, if that person has to become ordinary, both of these conditions should be satisfied, right? If, and if this first is not getting satisfied, we can simply say, so this person is a not ordinary. But if this gets satisfied, then you have to check this also because and is written over there. Second condition is again easy. It says that out of the 10 preceding years, out of the 10 preceding years, again, the same thing before pre previous year, we have to see 10 years. This person should be resident in two out of 10 years in this is previous year 23 24 then out of the 10 last years he should be resident in at least two years minimum two years he should be resident just apply basic condition for that we should be i'm not saying ordinary not ordinary just see whether in those 10 years in any two years if that person is a resident then we will see second condition is also satisfied and in case both the condition is satisfied, we will say the person is ordinary. And if any of the condition gets dissatisfied, the person is a not ordinary resident. Correct? Okay. Next thing is that because we have seen in the basic condition, there are two basic conditions. First is for 182 days. Second condition is 60 days or more. There is some exception. In some cases, we have to ignore this second condition. We will not see the second condition. We will only apply first condition, right? So what are those cases? First case is that if there is an Indian citizen, if there is an Indian citizen and he is going abroad, he is going out of India. Why he is going out of India? For employment outside. 
by employment i mean uh, whether he is going for a job outside or he is going for doing a business or profession outside india he is going for an employment outside he is going for working outside so in that case we will not see the 60 days condition we will see only 182 days condition right it is written over here also if indian citizen who leaves india during the previous year to work outside for employment outside right second condition is for indian citizen who is a crew member of indian ship for who is a crew member of indian ship we will not see this we will ignore this second condition we will only apply first condition 182 days third is if a person is an indian citizen or person of indian origin what does person of indian origin means that his parents or grandparents were born in undivided india undivided india means before independence right so if a person is a indian citizen a person is a uh, person of indian origin and he generally he uh, stays outside he works outside but he is just coming in india to have a visit for visit he is coming to spend for spending some vacation for spending some holidays he is coming to india maybe his family lives over here so he just uh, uh, come to india to have a visit over here so in that case also we will ignore that 60 days condition we will going to apply only 182 day, days condition over there right so these are the three exceptions so if question comes in your examination and if question mentions any of such point please remember please remember that you have to ignore 60 days condition over there you will apply only and only 182 days criteria right okay for indian crew member also there are I, as i was discussing initially uh, sometimes question comes regarding continuous discharge certificate so if question comes in our examinations in 2024 about continuous discharge certificate so please remember one thing that whatever the date which is entered as a starting date of a journey starting date of a journey till the end of the journey you should exclude that period completely that will not be regarded as stay in india and these dates are inclusive you have to exclude that also so you have to exclude start date also and till end date you have to exclude this period in between the period which is coming between both the dates you have to exclude that also so the date which is uh, which is mentioned over there as this is the date which where he has joined the ship or this is the date that he has signed off from the ship signed off means he has um ended the journey over there so both the days are inclusive and between those days you have to exclude that is not regarded as stay in india so this was a very this is very simple right okay now there is a special provision this is something which is important let me discuss this in detail okay so let's say uh, there is a person amit there is a person amit and he is an indian citizen or he is a person of indian origin because this provision is applicable to an indian citizen also or a person of indian origin also and this person amit is residing in dubai he lives in dubai okay so what he is doing in dubai let's say he has some business he might have some profession he is working with some company he has a job over there so he is having uh, his income in dubai and he has also one more business in dubai that is a cab service online business the same way which we uh, where we have a uh, ola or uber over here the same type of business he has in he is running in dubai from that business let's say in this previous year he has income of 25 lakh let's assume that he has an income of 25 lakh and the good thing about this business is that this business is controlled from india so this business is controlled from india so let's say he has some employees who is working for him and they are all sitting in india they have their back office operations everything is in india but this business is in dubai which is getting controlled from india okay and amit also used to come to india also because he has to take a control of his business so he keeps on visiting india but he makes sure that his number of days should never exceed 181 it should never touch 182 days why because he don't want to become resident 
So he plans his journey, he plans his visits in such a manner that it never touches 182 days. So first of all, tell me whether Amit is a resident or he is a non-resident. So we know whenever we say that an individual is a resident or non-resident, we just check our basic conditions. First basic condition is that whether he is in India for 182 days or no. And I have already mentioned that he plans his visits in such a manner that it never touches 182 days. So this condition is not getting satisfied. Okay. If first condition doesn't get satisfied, we go to the second condition. Second condition says 60 days or more during the previous year and 365 days or more in the last four preceding previous years. But that condition is not applicable to that this person. Why? Because we understand for Indian citizen or person of Indian origin. And if they come to visit India, he's only coming to visit India. Then in that case, we never see the second condition. We ignore that. We ignore that condition completely. And we just see only first condition that is 182 days. And because he is not in India for 182 days in the previous year, we will say that he is a non-resident. So this person is a non-resident. So what will happen if this person is a non-resident? This income, although this income is arising in Dubai, but it is controlled from India, but this income will not be taxed. Indian government will not be able to tax this particular income. Why? Because this person is now becoming a non-resident. For non-resident, we never see control. That, that control uh, provision is only for not ordinary resident. It is not for non-residents. So for non-resident, this income is not arising in India, not received in India. So we will not be able to tax this income. But now Indian government is very keen. They are very much interested to tax this particular income also. So they came up with a provision. They came up with a provision. They came up with a special provision. They say that if a person is, if a person is Indian citizen, or person of Indian origin, any, is an Indian citizen or person of Indian origin and his income other than foreign sources, other than foreign sources exceeds rupees 15 lakh, then we are going to apply a special provision on you. We will not apply those normal provision. We will apply some special provision for you to determine your residential status. I'm again repeating. If your income exceeds 15 lakh, that is more than 15 lakh, up to 15 lakh, this provision will not apply. We will see the old provisions as they were, right? But if the income exceeds 15 lakh, which income? Total income? No. Other than foreign sources income other than income from foreign sources other than foreign sources income other than foreign sources can you give a name to this a simple name to this let let me break this particular phrase into two part other than foreign first part sources other part keep sources at, as it is just name this thing uh, give it a simple name other than foreign other than foreign we can say indian sources right which is not foreign that is indian so i can say that if your Indian source income, if your Indian source income exceeds 15 lakh, then this provision will apply, right? Which provision will apply? To determine your residential status, whether you are resident or not, we will giving you a new basic conditions for them. Okay. First con basic condition is same. If you are in India for 182 days or more, then you will become resident. Or if first condition doesn't get satisfied, now there is a second condition also which we will apply on you, which is if this person is in India for 182, sorry, 120 days or more, this person is in India for 120 days or more, plus in the last preceding four years, 365 days or more, then this person will become resident. Then this person will become resident any of the condition if it gets satisfied any of the condition first condition is 182 days or more that this is same second condition is 120 days because that 60 days condition was initially was not applicable to such kind of people now we have come up with that condition also but with a little modification 120 days during the previous year and 365 days or more in the last four preceding year if any of the condition, if first condition gets satisfied, you will be resident. If this, no, this is not getting satisfied, this is getting satisfied, then this person will be a resident. If both the condition is not satisfied, you understand this person will become non-resident.
okay so special provision this will we will apply what will happen if we will make him resident what will happen if we will make a resident even eventually whether he will be a ordinary or not ordinary even if he does this person would be a not ordinary also we will be able to tax this income why because this income is getting controlled from india because for not ordinary also we can tax such income so this is the uh, um, manner in which indian government is able to tax such income also so they will say that if you are in india for 182 days or 120 days or more plus 365 days in the four preceding previous years right okay the second point arrives if this person becomes resident by satisfying either of these condition that whether he would be ordinary or not ordinary how we will check this so should we apply those conditions 730 days and out of 10 to in two years you should be resident no for them we will apply special provisions so what is the special provision to check whether they are ordinary or not this is very easy over here we will say that if you are in India for 120 days or more and up to 181 days, then you will become not ordinary. And if you are 182 days or more, then you will become ordinary. Right. So if you are for more number of days in India, then you will become ordinary 182 days or more and if you are in india for less than 182 days but anyways you you will be in india for 120 days this is for sure because that is the reason you become resident so you will be uh, this person will be in india for 120 days at least so if you are in india for 120 days or up to 181 days then not ordinary but if you are in india for 182 days or more then you will become a ordinary resident right so this is the provision over here so this says an Indian citizen or person of Indian religion who visits India, who visits India and his total income exceeds 15 lakh, which income excluding the income from foreign sources, you exclude other than foreign sources. So other than foreign sources is Indian source income. Now the question is, what is Indian source income? So this is also quite interesting. What is Indian source income? And we can easily uh, identify which is Indian source income. See any income which arises in india is an indian source income. any income which arises in india is an indian arise or deemed to arise both the same it is an indian source income second is any income which is received in india we will say it is an indian received or deemed to receive it is indian source income third point is this is important any income which does not arise neither receive in india but it is controlled from india if it is controlled from india we will say that it is also indian source income this is, if it is controlled from india also then we will say it is an in, uh, income from indian sources that is other than foreign sources income so if his income exceeds 15 lakh if this income exceeds 15 lakh the sum total of this, this income exceeds 15 lakh then special provision will be applicable to this assessee right I have mentioned also in your book also if you will see what is income other than foreign sources you can write Indian source over here other than foreign source means nothing but Indian source income. So income which arise in India or deemed to arise in India received in India or deemed to receive in India and income which is derived from a business which is controlled from India or a profession which is set up from India that is also known as income other than foreign sources in simple terms we can say Indian source income right okay. So this was important. One more provision is there. One more provision is there. Let's say if there is an assessee. Let's say if there is an assessee. Mr. X. Mr. X. And he stays. Let's say. Let me take the same example. He stays in Dubai. And he is not taxed in any of the country. He is not taxed in any of the country or any territory right so he arranges he makes arrangement in such a way he plans in such a way that he doesn't become resident in any of the country or he's not taxable in any of the country then there is a provision that have his indian source income because indian government is concerned only with the indian source income that we can say other than foreign sources income if you are other than foreign sources income exceeds 15 lakh rupees and if you are not taxable in any of the country 
due to the reason of your residency, due to the reason of your domicile or any other parameters. If you are not taxable in any of the country, then and if your Indian source income, Indian source income, we can say other than foreign sources income exceeds 15 lakh rupees, then you will always be considered as you will always be considered as not ordinary resident. You will always be considered as not ordinary resident because even if we will make him not ordinary, we will be able to take that income which is controlled from India, right? So this provision is only for Indian citizen. It is not for on person of Indian origin. This provision, which where you are not taxable in any of the country or any other territory, this provision is applicable only on Indian citizen. Here, person of Indian origin is not covered. Here, only Indian citizen is covered. Please remember that also. So this is mentioned on page number two point five. Next page. See special provision for Indian citizen. The last provision which we have covered is for Indian citizen or person of Indian origin. This is only for Indian citizen. So if there is an Indian citizen and his total income exceeds 15 lakh, which income other than foreign sources, we can say Indian sources income exceeds 15 lakh rupees. And this person is not liable to tax in any of the country due to his domicile, due to his residence or any other criteria. This person is not taxable in any of the country. In that case, he will always be resident, but what type of resident? Not ordinary resident, right? So this was important. Okay. So now we have already covered how to determine the residential status of individual. We know what are the basic conditions. We know what are the additional conditions. We have already covered the exceptions where we uh, ignore that 60 days condition. We know about continuous discharge certificate also now. Uh, the re they recorded as a start date till the end date we ignore that day that days are not included as number of that is not considered as number of days of stay in India and we know the special provisions also. So this is very important. So if you know about this uh, you can uh, imagine that you uh, already have covered 60 to 70 percent of your uh, this chapter of residential status. Okay. Now how to determine the residential status of HUF partnership firm and company? These are comparatively very easy. If I compare it with individuals, so these this do determine the residential status of HUF AOP BOA is comparatively very, very easy. Although in our examination, individual is uh, more important, but you should know about these uh, people also, how to calculate, how to determine the residential status. So for HUF, for HUF, first we will see that if the entire control and management, if the entire control and management, that is all the decisions of HUF, if they are happening outside India, if the entire control and management of HUF is taking place outside India, we will say that this HUF is a non-resident, right? And even if the partial control or management, even 1% decision is taken, play, is uh, getting uh, taking place in India, then we can say that this uh, HUF is a resident. So if the entire 100% control, if the entire control or management is outside India, we will say that this HUF is a non-resident. And even if the partial control and management is in India, if full or either full or partial, how much partial? Even 1%, even 0.1%. If it is controlled from India, then we will say that HUF is a resident. Okay. So let's uh, first we have to determine whether resident or non-resident. Once HUF becomes resident, whether they will be ordinary and not ordinary, will we will apply additional conditions. Additional condition is same: seven thirty days or more in the preceding seven years, or out of ten preceding previous years, out of ten you should be resident in two years. So we will apply those additional conditions on the karta of HUF, right? Who is the head of the family of HUF? We will apply those conditions over uh, karta on the manager of the HUF, the head of the family. So if Karta satisfies those additional conditions, then this HUF will become ordinary resident. But if Karta does not satisfy those additional condition, this HUF will become not ordinary resident, right? So HUF is comparatively very easy. And even for partnership firm, AOP, BY and company, it is uh, much easier. Okay. So first, we should understand for partnership firm, including LLP, or AOP or BOI, how we will determine the residential status. First, please understand that for uh, other than individual and HUF, for all other SSE, 
now there would be only resident or not resident there is no such thing like not ordinary and ordinary it is only and only for individual and HUF for other SSE it is only resident or not resident got it okay so for partnership from AOP BOI same pattern will be followed if the entire control and management of that partnership firm all the decisions related to the business are taking place outside India or even of AOP or BOI entire control and management is outside India we will say that they are non-resident right and even some of the control and management even partial control either full or partial control is in India then we will say this firm this AOP or BOI is a resident easy right okay residential status of company how we will determine that see if it is an Indian company if it is an Indian company Indian company is what which is registered in India uh, any um, in under the Companies Act 2013 or earlier act like 1956 if they are registered in India then we can say that this company is an Indian company so all Indian companies are resident see how examiner will confuse you examiner will ask you a question that this is so, so and so company and it is registered in India but they have businesses in US or they have business in Australia or any other part of the world so not in India but that person that company is an Indian company so please don't get confused over there if it is an Indian company always and always that in uh, uh, that Indian company will be a resident right so we can say the foreign company is non-resident generally yes foreign companies are non-resident but if their place of effective management place of effective management p o e m place of effective management if their place of effective management is in india we will say these foreign companies are also resident so what is place of effective management where some important decisions are taken that is called effectively managed effectively managed means what where some key managerial decision key commercial decisions are taken which actually affects the conduct of the business it affects the affairs of the business so where key management decisions are taken so let's say if there is a foreign company there are so many shareholders there there are two shareholders who comes to visit India and they are having a cup of tea or coffee they are sitting in a restaurant whether we can say that the, this is the place of effective management because they are just chit chatting no there are some there must be some key management decisions which are taking place in India if we can say that there is some place of effectively it is effectively getting managed from India then it will become a resident company right so place what is poem what is poem place where key management decisions yeah, commercial decisions are made that are necessary for the conduct of the business that we called poem place of factor management so what we have learned all indian companies whether they are operating outside india or anywhere within india or outside india but if they are registered in india they are indian company they will always be resident and if it is not an Indian company, but their place of effective management, their POEM, POEM, their POEM is in India, then we will say that, that also they will be a resident, right? Okay. So next part is scope of total income that we already know that if a person is an ordinary resident, we understand his global income is taxable, right? Their global income is taxable. Income which arises in India or deemed to arise in India income which is received in India or deemed to receive in India income which neither is getting arise in India nor received in India in fact that income also is taxable in the hands of ordinary resident so uh, for ordinary resident income arise or deemed to arise receive or deemed to receive in India or even outside India also that is income which is neither arising in India nor getting received in India that income is also taxable in the hands of ordinary resident and for non-resident only Indian, only Indian income. Indian income means which is getting arise in India or deemed to arise or getting received in India or deemed to receive in India. That is only the income which is taxable in the hands of non-resident. So if there is any income which is not arising in India nor it is received in India for non-resident, he is not going to pay tax in India. Sir, if it is controlled from India, no. Control is only for not ordinary. For non-resident, we will not tax that. Okay, please, uh, do you know that what is re received? What is the difference between remittance and received? See, we are concerned with received. We are not concerned with remittance, but you should know the difference between received, received and remittance. 
let's say you have a property you have a house let's say in australia you have a house in australia and there is a tenant uh, who pays rent of that house which is situated in australia please tell me where is the income arising in australia in india or australia in australia okay and he transfers your rent every month he pays you are sum of rent uh, he, some, he pays you in dollars in australian dollars and he pays you in your bank which is located in australia which is lo located in australia so he transfers the money every month he transfers the rent to your bank account which is in australia so please tell me have you received the amount the answer is yes it doesn't mean that you will physically receive that cash no you have received because if you, that that amount is credited in your that amount is deposited in your bank it means that you have received it where you have received it in australia right it is in your australia bank account and you can easily transfer that amount from australia to india right so if you are transferring from australia to india from your account only you are transferring from australia to india you are simply remitting that amount so that is not received it was actually uh, was received in australia itself now you are just transferring it we can say that you are just remitting it right but we are concerned with received let's say the tenant who is situated who is in australia he transfers the amount let's say this month rent he transferred directly into your indian bank account that is called received because first time where you are receiving that amount for the very first time that is called received so if first time you are receiving that amount directly in india that is called received right remittance is that you have already received it outside india you are just transferring that money into india that is remittance so for remittance we don't tax we uh, just tax if that income is received in india okay and for not ordinary resident you understand any income which is received in india or arise in india or deemed to receive deemed to arise in india that was that income will be taxable and even if income is neither arise in india nor uh, arising in india nor received in india but if it is controlled from india then not ordinary resident will have to pay tax because that is controlled from india okay now a very interesting question comes what is income which is deemed to arise in india because we understand if you let's say if you have a business in india that income is arising from india if you have a property in india that and if you have income from any uh, any income from that property that income is arising in india so what is deemed to arise means okay so this is quite important let me give you an example of deemed to arise let's say there is person mr suman he is an indian citizen he is an indian citizen and he gets a job with government of india he is a government of india employee and government of india sends him to us is government of india sends him to us because we have let's say uh, in us we have indian embassy office we have indian embassy office and this office let's say is situated let's say in new york and we sent sumit to new york and he is residing in new york for last 2 3 years he comes to india but uh, for a very short period let's say every year he comes to indian festival to celebrate some festival with uh, his family uh, for let's say for 10 days or 20 days and so not more than that so this person sumit is a non resident right because he is in india he comes every year just for 15 20 days that's it so this person is a non resident right tell me where he is rendering services sir he is rendering services in new york in us he is rendering his services and he is getting paid from government of india although and where he is receiving the amount also government of india uh, gives his amount to a bank which is which is there in us itself so this amount is neither arise in india nor getting arise in india nor is received in india it is outside india and this person is a non resident so this person will say that this income is not taxable in india because it is i am rendering my services in us i am getting this money received in us so i'll not be going to pay uh, pay tax in india because i am a non resident okay but lawmakers has inserted a provision 
that if a assessi is an indian citizen remember if an assessi is an indian citizen and he is getting salary he or she is getting salary from government of india from government of india although he is working abroad although he is working abroad but you are getting salary from government of india then the salary income which you are getting would be deemed to arise it will be assumed what is deemed deemed means it will be assumed that this income is getting a rise in india so this income will be rise in india and this will come will be taxable also and you remember one more point we are uh, discuss this point in the chapter of salary also see sumit will be receive uh, must be receiving basic salary okay he must be receiving some allowances also what we call such type of allowances these are foreign allowances right because he is working abroad he must be might be receiving some perquisites also right so his this all income is deemed to arise in india and this income will be taxed here also but we will tax we will going to tax only his basic salary we will not going to tax his allowances or perquisites this foreign allowances or foreign perquisites will not be taxed why because they are exempt under section 10 they are exempt under section 10 please remember this because this such type of questions has already been asked in the examination in the past right so allowances and perquisites are exempt under section 10 sir so what we will um, do in uh, if we are following default tax regime or we we are following offset tax regime in both the regimes the treatment is same foreign allowances and foreign perquisites are exempt whether uh, the question is asking you to follow default tax regime or the question is asking you to follow offset tax regime only the basic salary will be taxed right so although this income is deemed to arise in india but by the virtue of section 10 provisions allowances and foreign perquisites would be exempt right the first thing what is the income which is deemed to arise in india it is covered under section 9 salary paid by government of india first thing government of india who is they are paying salary to whom to an indian citizen if they are paying salary to a foreigner no then you will not you cannot take they are paying salary to an indian citizen for services rendered outside india but please note i have already mentioned over here all allowances and perquisites are exempt under section 10 and under both the tax regime whether you are following your default new tax regime or you are following your optional tax regime right okay let me give you the uh, let me discuss the second point also because this is something which is very important second point says let's say there is a person who is residing in australia his name is mr mark okay mr mark Mr Mark is a IT professional he is a IT professional and he is quite good at his work he is quite skillful and there is a company there is an indian company there is an indian company let's say they are based in bangalore they know that mr mark is quite useful for them so they offer mr mark that please work for us we will be going to pay you salary we will be going to pay you 5 lakh rupees per month salary mark find this offer quite interesting he says okay i'll be coming to uh, india now and i'll work for you but let's say he says that i'll uh, be coming after one month please uh, give me one month's time then after that i'll be coming and joining your indian office okay we will say okay but he says that i want salary from the from this date itself from this date itself i want salary for one month salary is getting without coming into india without coming into into india we are giving him salary so 5 lakh which we have given it to him while he is not in india but after that he comes to india once he comes to india all the salary which he is he will receive that is simply we can say that is arising in india but what about this 5 lakh because this was a for the rest period this was for the rest period or before joining or in fact we have given this amount what amount this what about this amount so section 9 has said that any amount which you have received because of the services which you have rendered in india whether you have received this amount after your services or before your services this amount will be deemed to arise in india so this amount will also be taxable right i can give you one more example let's say there was a person who was uh, 
first of all he was living in india he has a job over here in india and he has spent some uh, let's say entire life he has spent in india and uh, after that he gets retired and he is getting pension also he is getting pension also we understand that pension is also taxable we know about salary okay so let's say now he has moved uh, with his uh, children who stays in us now he this person lives in us for for last Three four years, this person is now retired and he is living in US. But still, he must might be getting that pension over there. So that pension is also deemed to be a rise in India because why he is receiving that pension? Because he has rendered services in India, right? So this is the second point: salary earned for the services rendered in India, salary payable for leave period, rest period, which is preceded, which is preceded. it was the example of mark which is preceded and we have given him 5 lakh rupees or succeeded succeeded means we are paying after the service so that is pension if we are paying and if you are getting pension outside india also but why you are getting pension because you have already rendered services in india that indian employer is paying you pension then that pension is also taxable in india right third point is point easy if you are receiving dividend from indian companies or even interest from indian companies if you are getting receiving interest on debentures of or you are uh, receiving dividend from indian companies so that dividend or that interest will be deemed to arise in india right fourth point is quite interesting it deals with interest first interest second is royalty and third is fees for technical services i am again repeating interest royalty and fees for technical services for all three the provisions are same all three the provisions same let me explain you let's say we have mr paul and he is a us citizen and he is he resides in us itself he resides in us and he is a us citizen but he is quite a rich guy in fact he is uh, a ultra rich guy he is a ultra rich person and he lent some money also he used to lend some money on interest and whatever interest he earns this is his income so there are people who borrows money from him even he he has so much money that some government also some other country government also borrows money from paul okay so whatever interest he he might be getting that is his income right so let's say indian government indian government borrows money from paul so indian government borrows money from paul so who is indian government indian government is borrower right so indian government might be paying interest also because mr paul will give money to indian government but he, he will say that i will charge 10% per annum interest 12% per annum interest whatever the rate he is charging indian government has said okay we will pay you the interest so that interest which we are paying to paul that interest would be taxable in the hands of paul in india that would be taxable in india that is deemed to arise in india section 9 has given us a provision that if indian government will pay you interest they will pay you royalty or they will pay you fees for technical service for all three the provisions are same so whether that indian government has used the money because indian government has borrowed let's say some uh, 10 million dollars 20 million dollars 30 million dollars they have borrowed let's say so where they have used the money they can use the money anywhere anywhere whether in india they can they the borrowed funds which they have taken they have used that money in india or they can use that money outside india also that is not a problem that is irrelevant they can use the money in bangladesh they can use the money anywhere in the world but if indian government will pay you interest so that interest which mr paul is receiving this non resident is receiving that interest will be deemed to arise in india right okay the second point is if the amount is borrowed let's say the amount is borrowed not by indian government let's say by any resident any indian resident so if the amount is borrowed by any resident so the interest which this resident would be paying to paul that interest will be deemed to arise in india if what will resident do he borrowed money from paul and this resident invests that money in india 
this person invest that money in India. Where he invests this money? Let's say he has started his own business, whether he has invested his money, this money, this borrowed funds in his own business, or he has invested in others' business also. Others' business also. But one thing was sure that he has invested this money in India, either in his own business or in some other's business. Other means other business means that he has purchased some debentures of some other company, he has purchased some shares of some other company. That means he has made an indirect investment, right? So if this resident has invested that money in India, whether in his own business or in others' business also, if this person has invested that money in India, then whatever interest which he will be paying to Paul, that interest will be deemed to arise in India and Mr. Paul has to pay tax for that also, right? Okay, the last point here is, if the money is borrowed by any other non-resident, I'm discussing all those points with you. Let's say Paul has given money, Paul has given loan, the borrower is other non-resident. Okay, so this is other non-resident and where he has invested the money, this non-resident has invested the money in India only and only in his own business, only own business. Then the interest which this non-resident must be paying to Paul, that interest will be deemed to arise in India. So if this non-resident invests the money in India in their own business. Sir, what if, if this non-resident has invested the money in others' business, let's say he has purchased shares or debentures of some other company? No. In that case, that interest which this non-resident is paying to Paul, that will not be deemed to arise in India. Only when, only when that non-resident has invested the money in his own business. Right? So if this non-resident has invested the money outside India, definitely will that interest which this non-resident might be giving to Paul, that will be not be taxable. Even if he has invested that money in India, but indirect investment, that is he has invested the money in any other's business like he has purchased shares or debentures, then the interest which he will be paying to Paul, that interest will not be deemed to arise in India. Yes, of course, if he has invested the money in uh, Indian shares or Indian debentures, the dividend or interest which he is receiving from that Indian company, that would be taxable for sure. There is no problem on that. But I am saying the interest which he would be giving to Paul, that will only be deemed to arise in India if this non-resident has invested the money in his own business. So what is the difference here? In these two, what is the difference here? If the resident is a borrower, the resident is the borrower. He can invest the money in India, in his own business also, in others' business also. But if the non-resident is the borrower, then if he has invested the money only in his own, own business, then only the interest which he is paying to Paul, that interest would be taxable. Or fees for technical services or royalty, same provisions will apply. Right? So this was important. Okay? This is quite easy. Any income accruing or arising to an assessee in any place outside India, that assessee is sitting any, in any part of the world. But if he is getting income, why? Because of any property which is situated in India or because of any asset which is situated in India. So let's say he is getting a rental income of which property that property is in India. So that income is, will be deemed to arise in India, right? Or through the transfer of any capital asset situated in India. Let's say uh, there is a US company and there is another Netherlands company. There is a US company, Netherlands company and they are having a transaction. What they are selling, they are selling Indian company shares. So the subject matter, the what are getting transferred, let's say US companies are selling their Indian shares to this Netherlands company. So in that case also, this income will be deemed to arise in India because why? The assets which are getting transferred are capital assets of India, right? The transfer of any capital assets which are situated in India. Okay, now the next part. This is also very important from examination point of view. It says, these are the income which are not deemed to arise in India. They are not considered as arise in India. So will not be taxing such income. So in case of non-resident, in case of non-resident, the following income shall not be deemed to accrue or arise in India. So we will not be taxing these, these incomes because they will not be considered as deemed to arise in India. Okay. So let's say if
let's say there is a company abc incorporation and it is a singapore based company it is a singapore based company they have their operations in multiple countries let's say they have uh, operations in india also let's say 10% of the revenue comes from india 20% of the revenue comes from let's say us and uh 70% of the revenue comes from singapore itself so they have their businesses operations in india us and singapore also so please tell me which income will be deemed to arise in india only which is related to indian operations which is only attributable to india which is only attributable to india we can say that we can tax this income we will not be going to tax income which is attributable to us or to singapore only which is related to india so it is clearly mentioned here in the law that if a business has operations in different countries so we can only uh, tax such income which is attributable to india which in any income which is attributable outside india that is us or singapore we will not going to tax that income so here it is written in case of a business let's say singapore based company where all operations are not carried out in india because they have operations in singapore also or in us also indian income shall only be such part that is reasonably attributable to the operations carried out in india whatever operations which is related only to india we are going to tax that income only okay second point says that if you are just purchasing goods from india you are just purchasing goods from india and you will be exporting all these goods that means that you are not uh, having any income in india in fact you are doing only expenses in india you are not earning any income because you are just purchasing your um, uh, activities are just confined to just limited to purchases right if you are only purchasing and whatever you have purchased from india you will you are going to export that so you are not earning any income right you are in fact incurring expenses over here so in that case also if you are just purchasing goods from india and you will like going to export that goods you are not going to sell that goods in india so if you are just purchasing we will say that income is not going to arise in india because there is no in income as such right third point is that if let's say there is any news channel a foreign news channel let's say bbc there it is bbc and bbc is telecasting their let's say for example they are telecasting their news in uh, other parts of the country uh, other parts of the globe let's say in us so let's say bbc is telecasting a program that is getting telecasted in us let's say in us it is getting telecasted or in uk united kingdom it is getting telecast not not uttarakhand okay so if bbc is telecasting any program in uk or in us or in australia or in new zealand anywhere not in india and they are in this program they are showing some news which is related to india they are just showing some news which is related to india so that does this means that this income is getting a rise in india the answer is no so lawmaker says clearly mentioned that if you are just uh, giving indian news on any foreign channel if you are giving just any um, indian news it does not mean that that income is getting a rise in india yes if this program is getting telecasted in india also then we can say that it is deemed to rise in india which is related to india right but if you are just giving news or views related to india then we will say that this income is not getting a rise in india so here it is mentioned collection of news or views in india for transmission outside india okay next point says let's say there is a, a hollywood film which is getting um, shoot okay there is a holiday a hollywood um, movie which is getting shoot by any non resident and in his two hours or three hours movie he is showing one minute or two minutes clip of related to india he has in uh, he has done some shooting in india only so he is he will release that movie only outside india he will not release that movie in india but but just a scene or five minutes movie or 10 minutes clip he has shown which is related to india so does it does that mean that that income would be deemed to arise in india the answer is no we have just taken we have just we came in india we just shot for two or three days and then we went back we will be releasing the movie also in outside india itself 
So in that case, we are not going to tax that particular income, right? But if that individual who is making that movie, that person is a Indian citizen, then we will be able, to, uh, we can able to tax that income. We will say, and if that person is an Indian citizen, then we will say that this income was deemed to arise in India. Or if that movie is made by any partnership firm, if any of the partner is a resident or a citizen of India, or if it is made by any company, any of the shareholder is a resident or citizen of India, then we can say that that income is deemed to arise in India. But if they are completely foreigners, then we will say that income is de not deemed to arise in India. Right. Last is any activities confined to display of rough diamonds in notified zone. What does this mean? That there are some notified zones which are notified by government. They say that those people who deals in diamonds, those uh, people who are diamond dealers, they can come and um, exhibit their diamonds. They are not selling their diamonds. They are just uh, coming for an exhibition. They are just coming for an exhibition. In that case also, they, that income will not be deemed to arise in India. Right? They are just displaying their rough diamonds over there so this was important that what type of income will not be deemed to arise in india will not be considered as not arising in india so this can come in your mcq okay the last portion of this chapter what is income deemed to be received you have not actually received but it is assumed that you have deemed to be received in india it would be assumed that you have received it so this is uh, more or less related to salary portion and I believe that you have already done salary although you have not done the revision but still you must might have done salary once or twice. So let's discuss this point also. So we understand the, the employer contributes to RPF recognized provident fund. So if you are if a person is working somewhere and his employer is contributing in RPF is he getting that money right now? or he will get that money at a later date, at a later date, whenever he will resign from that company or whenever he will be uh, resigning or he will be uh, retiring from that company, then only he will be receiving that amount. Before that, he will not receive that amount. But still, we assume that you have deemed to receive. That is the reason we tax every year in excess of, but we understand in salary, we have learned in excess of 12% of your retirement benefit salary. We see your basic salary, DA forming part, fixed percentage commission on turnover. And if it is in excess of 12% of that, then we tax that income because we assume that it is deemed to be received in India, right? Similarly for pension scheme, if an employer contributes to pension scheme, every year we tax that income. Every year we tax that income, we make part of that salary gross salary for you right although you have not received that pension you will receive you will be receiving it once you will be retired from that particular company or once you will be resigning that company then you can withdraw that amount before that you cannot withdraw that but if you are uh, getting pension although you have not received it but it was deemed to be received we tax every year right although there is a deduction uh, in atccd we will we, which we will be discussing in our deduction revision yes you will be getting a deduction but every year which the pension which is getting accumulated in your pension scheme that is deemed to be received in india and the last portion is if employer has contributed in urpf urpf is unrecognized provident fund and we understand that in salary, uh, we study this, that any amount which is going in URPF, we don't tax it unless and until we have received that amount. Okay. So URPF is taxable only when it is actually received. But there are some employers who transfers this URPF balance to RPF. Let's say they have initially they have opened a URPF. But later on a later date, they are transferring this all these funds from URPF to RPF. Then what will happen? Then whenever this amount will be transferred to RPF and whatever the amount which is in excess of 12%, it will be deemed to be received in India and it will be taxed. It is assumed that you have received that amount, but in excess of 12% of RPF salary, right? So this was about deemed to be received, although question uh, never, uh, there is, I don't think that there is any question which is asked and passed also, although this is not very important from examination point of view, but you should understand that there are something which is like deemed to be received also. Okay, so this was about this chapter. So you can do your past examination questions also or questions of RTP or MTB also. This is very much essential for you to practice, right? 
so let's meet in our next chapter now uh, that would be salary okay till then take care and bye bye